So just let me know if, I, if you can't hear me. Uh, I'll, I'll speak closer to the mic. I'm not usually speaking into the mic. So. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon, welcome, uh, and again, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Miriam Fine. I'm the organizer of Science Advocacy of Long Island, or as we like to call her, Sally. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're a new group on, on Long Island, and we're entirely composed of volunteers uh, that we see right here helping us, um, and our goal is to promote scientific policies uh, and also make science more accessible to everyone. So this is our first event, um, and hopefully we'll have many more to come. Um, I also want to thank uh, Action Together Long Island, uh, who is help, helping us uh, support this event. So no matter who you are, you've probably been doing science in your entire life. Uh, as a kid, you might have played in the bathtub with uh, the toys, and some of them would float, and some of them would sink, and you would wonder why that is. And uh, you came up with some theory about it, or a hypothesis, and you would test it. And it didn't toys, shapes, and sizes, and eventually come to some sort of conclusion. Um, so even back then, you were a young scientist. So we're here today because all of us, we're passionate about science. Um, and we want to share our passion with you and maybe even reignite a little bit of your own. Uh, we'll begin by giving you each a brief description of what we do. And um, then we're going to open it up to just questions, discussions. Um, and we're going to do our best to provide whatever answers we can. Um, and based on what you are interested in, we'll hopefully make more uh, events in the future that will be focused on specific topics. Uh, so what I want to do is just show a quick video right now, and then we'll get into the introductions. I used to hate science. Now, this was back when I thought that science was a collection of boring facts that had no clear relevance to my personal life. But I now know that I was wrong because science is a process. It is an elegant, beautiful process because it's so simple. The process of science is literally gathering evidence and then using that evidence to guide future decisions. What this means is that you, your family, your friends, everyone that you know conducts science on a daily basis. We all use evidence to inform our future decisions, or at least we should all be doing that. So this process is not only incredibly simple, but it's globally accessible to everyone. And despite its simplicity and its accessibility, it actually has led to incredible, profound, life-changing progress. Fruits of scientific labor affect you constantly. In fact, everything that you love about your modern life is either directly or indirectly the result of science. The device that you're using right now, obviously, decades of science went into that. But the food that you eat, that you feed to your family, that food is the result of agricultural science. The health of your loved ones, the health of your pets, that has been enhanced and sustained by incredible amounts of scientific research. Of course, the vehicles that you drive and the planes that you fly in, these are modern marvels that directly result from science, which, by the way, of course, got us to the moon. So science has constructed our modern civilization. It has allowed us to flourish, and it has enhanced the lives of every single person on the planet. This includes people from all sides of the political spectrum. So, it doesn't matter what labels you assign to yourself, you nonetheless are benefiting on a moment-to-moment -moment basis from the fruits of scientific labor. And so, a war on science, or an attempt to slow science, or silence science, is ultimately an attempt to hinder human progress. And this not only threatens our current existence, which again is completely built on and run by science, but it is incredibly threatening to our descendants, to our children, to our grandchildren, 
these people will require science to live happy, healthy lives. So when you hear people turning science into a political chess piece, and they're arguing that science is only for certain people, and it has some hidden agenda, and, and so on and so forth, block that out. And remember, science is not political, but science is an essential pillar of society, and we need it to survive. Professor of Biology at Hofstra University. Uh, I teach ecology and conservation biology, evolution, courses of that nature. And I think from the context of this group, what's most important is uh, my research focuses on uh, a variety of, of, of really wildlife human interactions. Uh, so I'm interested in species that are overabundant and therefore uh, you know, problematic. Uh, and uh, you know, so uh, uh, raccoons in your backyard you know, might be part of that. Uh, I deal with species that are rarer than we'd like them to be, so uh, you know, rare and endangered species. And I'm interested in, in broad issues like climate change and evolution and the way people think about science. And, um, and uh, so I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty familiar with uh, addressing these kinds of issues. And I'm just starting to get in, in more involved in uh, contaminants and pollution studies. I've been somewhat involved for a while, but very more serious about that issue as well. So, good night. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Emilis Burgos, uh, and that name I sound foreign to you, and that's actually because I'm not from around here. I was born and raised in Lithuania, and I left after high school to pursue an academic career. So first I went to the University of Cambridge in England, got my bachelor's degree, and then I moved to the United States to pursue a doctorate in biological sciences. So currently I'm at Close Harbor Laboratory, and I also work on breast cancer. Um, and specifically what I look at is how the immune system uh, can basically uh, cause relapse of cancer that we think is already eradicated. Um, and uh, as shown by the movie, I think uh, I, as many other scientists, agree that uh, science is not really a partisan issue and that we're all in this together and I'm looking forward to a you know, fruitful discussion with you. Hi, my name is Jackie, Jackie Novak. I'm currently an assistant professor at Long Island University School of Pharmacy. And I'm really interested in understanding how our bodies work properly in the first place. And once we understand how they work properly in the first place, we can hopefully better fix problems when they go wrong. Um, and I recently just left Hopefully Have a Laboratory where I worked in a lab that led to uh, the discovery of a new drug for spinal muscular atrophy. And I'm currently studying drug resistance in HIV. Um, I'm also the mommy of two kindergartners, and we do lots and lots of experiments with sink and float in our bathtub. <laughs> and we're also really passionate about science education. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Mike, uh, and I study pancreatic cancer. And, uh, you know, as the video really spoke about, I'm really excited about uh, being a scientist because I get to make new discoveries and solve problems and use this information to really help people that are suffering from uh, terrible diseases. 
And so uh, in the lab, what I do, or some of the work that I do, is actually taking tumor tissue from uh, cancer patients growing up in the lab, and then trying to understand if there's specific drugs that might target those individual patients so we could treat uh, patients more effectively. Hi, my name is uh, Brandon. So I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, and what that is, is if you think about the brain like a computer, my job is to figure out what apps are running on the brain. Um, and in particular, I study the apps that control attention. Um, and how those apps change over time. So I've done some research looking, my PhD research right now is on how those apps change as you get older. I've done some work looking at how people with ADHD, how their apps are a little bit different than people who don't have ADHD. Um, and for the kids in the room, I've actually done some research on how video games can affect those apps. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah, and uh, I'm a associate professor at Farmingdale State College. Um, and I love viruses, which sounds really weird. Um, but people don't like viruses very much, and I certainly don't like what they do to people. But um, I am privileged to be able to study herpes virus in the lab. And once you really get to the details of how viruses do what they do, they're really fascinating. Um, in addition, I also uh, get to teach biology and virology to undergraduate students. And I get to do a lot of advising to students, which it's kind of awesome because it means that I get to really kind of raise the next generation of scientists. And I also have kids, uh, so I'm literally raising the next generation of scientists. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, my name is Ashley Alexi. I'm an analytical chemist. I work for a clinical toxicology lab um, in Nassau County. Um, when I was a kid, I always had really great science teachers, always had a really good science background, very fortunate. Um, and in this political climate, Seeing how people see science as this scary thing is really discerning. So I think this is a really good chance for all of us to kind of meet you guys and you to meet us and have a good conversation like that. Hi, I'm Abraham, uh, and I'm a geneticist, and I was meeting the lab uh, <laughs> at the Genetics and IDF Institute in Virginia um, about 20 years ago. And, <laughs> Uh, my mother will tell you that the doctors that made me uh, sort of waved their hands over the petri dish and said, this person will become a geneticist. <laughs> that is how I ended up here. Uh, so I am, uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, and then I made the lab, I went to a high school that was called lab, and now I work in the lab. Uh, and, uh, I study, um, I use microscopes to study how cells gain the ability to move around the body. Uh, and that is what I do. Uh, I use genetic engineering and other techniques to Hey, I'm Casey. Um, I'm here because I'm really passionate about science education. I'm a high school teacher right now in science. I've been for the last 15 years. Um, I'm kind of responsible for explaining all their stuff to all those people that aren't sort of the professionals in the uh, in the industry, I guess. Um, before I became a teacher, I worked at the United States Geological Survey studying really tiny fossils for a little while. Um, then I did some contracting work for the federal government for FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA. Uh, worked as a field geologist here on Long Island for a little bit before I got into teaching, and I'm really just happy to be here with all these great scientists and take your questions today. Okay, thank you guys. Um, so I'm gonna. I can either start off with some questions that you've written down, or I can open it up right now, and, and if you have just right off the bat any questions, we can start from there and see where we go. So, um, do we have somebody who wants to ask our first question? Go ahead. Good question. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Brandon. You so said you did research regarding video games in the brain? Yes. All right, that's interesting to me because I play a lot of video games. <laughs> <laughs> what is your research concluded about the effect briefly of video games on the brain? Well, the effect of them. Uh, <laughs> well, um, Do you guys need me to use this or can I just... No. no. Okay. So, the short answer is video games do affect the brain, um, but not necessarily as badly as people might expect. In fact, um, in the right circumstances, it can actually be beneficial. Um, there's a lot of research right now into cognitive training and cognitive rehabilitation. Um, uh, have any of you heard of a company called Lumosity, for example? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing, right? Um, actually, as it turns out, a lot of the research on things like Lumosity shows that it doesn't really have that much of an effect on training your attention and things like that. But video games, in many cases, will train your, atten train your attention and other cognitive abilities more than things like Lumosity. 
So there was one study, there's a game called Portal, um, it's mm -hmm. a puzzle game, uh, you might be familiar with it, I don't know if anybody else is, and they compared Portal to Lumosity games, and they found that people got a greater benefit in their ability to think, solve problems and make decisions from playing Portal than from playing the Lumosity games. Um, the problem with the research right now is that it's very inconsistent and it's not always very well done. So a lot of it, it's a very new field and so it's still growing. So it's hard to say exactly how much of a benefit you can get from games. Um, but I think it depends on what games that you're playing and how much you're playing them. Any, if you do anything too much, it's going to be a problem. Um, but if you play the right games in the right situations, that can be a benefit. If you play the wrong games in the wrong situations, that can be a problem. Um, so, <laughs> so, just to give you a couple of examples, um, there was a, an ex a study where they, they invented their own video game, with this group invented their own video game to help kids who had autism and other kinds of social interaction problems. Um, and they had, but the game was designed so that you had to work together in order to win the game. And they found that after they started playing this game together, these kids were able to interact better socially. So it's not necessarily cognitive enhancement, but it could be just sort of social enhancement. Um, another example was there was a statistics professor who had their students play Dance Dance Revolution. And then they took the scores from Dance Dance Revolution and they used that those numbers as a data set to teach them how to do statistics. Now, look, you didn't get a direct benefit from playing games, but they did find that when they got this data from something that the kids were interested in and, and cared about, they paid more attention to the statistics and did better on their tests at the end of the semester. So there are a lot of ways that things like video games can be really beneficial to you, even if they're not necessarily directly giving you that benefit. Right. psychologically anyways addicted to basically anything, right? As long as you get enough enjoyment and enough dopamine and serotonin released in your brain, when you do that, that can create some kind of an addiction. Um, video games can be a bit more dangerous only because they're, they use the principles of behavior modification that, to make sure you want to keep playing the game, right? We know very, very well you know, we do these experiments with rats and they have to press the button and if they press the button they get food and we know exactly what intervals to give the mouse food when they press buttons to figure out, you know, what's going to make them press the button the most. And we can do the exact same thing with people and it works exactly the same way. Um, have any of you ever played the game World of Warcraft or any of, um, a lot of the MM uh, online RPGs? There, there's a very common quest. Go out and get ten of an item and bring it back for me, right? And what you find is when you go out and you, let's say you have to you kill a wolf to get a pelt, but it only drops the pelt 30% of the time. That's chosen really, really specifically, right? It's, it's called a variable interval schedule. So you don't know when you're going to get a reward, but you know you'll eventually get the reward. And that's been shown to be the most effective thing to keep you pressing the button. So video games are really, video game designers, they know how to make you want to keep playing, keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. So I think that that's why this concern pops up more often with games. But again, that's why I said in moderation, they can be good. It's just you have to be careful. All right, I'm not sure there's a venue for this. I have no problem with the positive impact and effect that science has on our lives. I'm having an enormous problem with the impact that politics is going to negatively impact science, positively impact it. So, you know, I'm good big on, you know, strong thumbs. There are no scholarships for these, but what are you all doing and what can we do to make sure that science stays Factual, not alternative factual, but actual factual. <laughs> uh, so that we and our kids can totally get what science has to offer in terms of improving our lives instead of undermining our lives. 
if the stroke specialist had not done this test, we still wouldn't know what caused my illness. They thought I was having knee strokes because that's what it looked like. So is there something we can do to maybe let people know more about this so people don't have to suffer like that? I have started a support group for depression and anxiety already. No, specifically for what you're working with. It's, that's one of those things that's very difficult to come across, though. So it's not like a common thing. Like depression and anxiety is a common thing. I started a support group, and it has been very helpful. Well, thank you. So address that. I think the support group idea is it's, it's a rare disease, exactly. So I think now that, you know, with uh, everyone's genome being sequenced, um, they can find the genetic causes of all these diseases, and I think at the, at the same time, you know, these support groups are out there, people can look online and say, like, you know, type in your symptoms, and then something like that pops up, and you can say, oh, maybe it's this. And so there are a number of rare diseases that are being filled out, you know, um, by all these people. You never knew what they had, but now you know what they have, and now you have a genetic, and the more people you have, the more likely you are to find the genetic cause of that disease, okay. which can then find more people. So, support group is the best idea. Okay. Yeah, so talk to people. Do what you're yeah. doing now, and I think, you know, Jackie might be able to tell you better about that, but how did they figure out the, uh, the SMA link with Coles Blatt? That's a great story about right place at the right time, just people talking, right? Well, um, Along those lines, one thing I wanted to suggest, in addition to starting, check Facebook. Um, because there probably is a, I don't remember my letter, but. I remember my mother, father, that's the only way I can I almost guarantee you there is a Facebook page about it. Big, you can't even pronounce. If there is a Facebook page about it, great. If there isn't, either start one, or if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, that is where you will find all of the experimental treatments for everything that is out there. Can we go to I've gone to these clinical trials before, and I'm the type that when something is told to me, I get out there. The research is taking me a long time to understand what's going on. Everything is so clinically written that I, when the doctor told me what it was, and I went home and read it, I was like, huh? So there are. And I'm not a stupid person, like I'm a very intelligent person. I couldn't understand it. So I'm sure so many people don't know it because nobody tests for it. So there are very rare diseases. There are more common rare diseases and then really rare diseases. Um, there's a professor at Colston Harvard who is actually studying a disease that so far has been seen in one family. Um, but he's using that disease as a model to try to understand how different parts of the brain work. Because clearly something is going wrong in this one family, and maybe we can understand from that how the brain works to better help every, everybody. Um, but what Casey was referring to before, it's a different disorder. But um, so I told you that I was very interested in how our bodies work properly so that we can better understand and fix when things go wrong. Um, the lab I was in studied a process called RNA splicing. And this, this is how instructions in our bodies get edited so we can make the right proteins. And just like if you have a typo in a manuscript or you edit a page, you miss a paragraph in a, in a paper, it won't make any sense. If RNA is edited incorrectly, the resulting protein won't make any sense and won't work properly. Our lab was studying RNA splicing for the sake of understanding how RNA splicing works. There was no immediate connection to the gene that was known at the time. Then, in the 19, late 1990s, clinicians identified a mutation or a mistake in the RNA in patients with this disease, spinal atrophy. That at that point was a rare disease. It had no known cure, you just supported the symptoms, but patients would die from this disease. Very young, it's the most severe, it's, it's fatal by the age of two. And they realized that the disease was caused by a problem in RNA splicing. So the clinicians studying spinal muscular atrophy called a meeting with the leading experts in the world in RNA splicing, who at that point, my advisor had never known what, had never looked at a neuron. He didn't know anything about the brain or spinal cord or anything clinical. He was really a basic out of the cell work in the first place person. So when they explained, wait, this disease is caused by a problem in this basic process that you're studying, he was like, wait, maybe I can do something about this. 18 years later, the drug was approved by the FDA. Um, so basic research can really lead to cures for these diseases. <coughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
lot longer than other people his own age having the same sort of things. Um, and my doctor had said to me casually, um, you know, some kids just get sick from it. And then I said, well, this doesn't make sense to me. So should I take him to an immunologist? You can if you want to. So I said, well, then I want to. You have to kind of be your own advocate. But my, my suggestion, I don't know how practical this is, if there's somebody who out, some sort of outreach to the doctors and suggest that kids who are having these outlying issues maybe should see an immunologist. Because when we went to the immunologist, we found out that my son has an immune deficiency disorder, which we never would have known if I hadn't taken him to the immunologist in the first place on my own accord. So maybe we need to have like some sort of dialogue with doctors and say, it's okay, you don't know the answer, but maybe someone else does. Yeah. Yeah. And just geneticists also. I mean, there are specifically genetic doctors out there, so it's wonderful people to involve the whole. To involve the yeah. nutrition and the doctors to know that there's another option besides just saying, well, maybe you just get some more. I almost thought it because nobody spoke up. I got cellulitis and it was so bad that the first time I lost my life, the second time I almost died because I got them within a couple months of each other and my body had nothing to fight with until we found out about this illness. And now that I'm on folic acid and 12 and other vitamins, specific vitamins, I'm doing much better. I'm not sick all the time like I was.
our best to figure out how we can best educate people on this and how we can best make people awesome. awesome. So, um, just get through. Hi. So, I wanted to say, because I, I listened to a couple of questions, and I think that what I'm hearing, maybe I'm wrong, this is what I'm hearing, is that what we, the general public, uh, would like to just would like to know is specifically how do we support the science community? I think everybody in this room generally understands that, like, without you guys, <laughs> it's going to be a tough place to live on this in this world, right? So we need to know because we're also concerned, you know, for what's going to be happening. Like, what would how do, is there, for example, with whatever institutions you're with? Um, is there a way for us to plug in in terms of how we can support? Even for example, is it donations funding? Do we need to write letters to the presidents of your organization? Are there efforts that we can coordinate our you know, so that's the first, that's one question for part A for that question. And part B, like in terms of um, what you were saying, like being a critical thinker. So I think that it's very difficult because we, a lot of times when you read a science article, um, you don't even understand, unless you are of your world, a good deal of the information that's in there, so it's hard to be critical. So I don't know if this source exists, but if there is a place where scientists, for example, are maybe posting things that they understand are possibly misinformation, where we can go like a Snopes, but that's focused on science, where we can go to XYZ destination and go, is this a for real thing? And maybe even post links to things that are going on in the press that are nonsense. Because I would know how to be critical yeah. about science. I've been brought up before. So I'll say there are a lot of uh, science blogs that are written by scientists or people who are scientists that are now science journalists. You can find them. There's are out there. There's some great ones out there, and I, we should probably make up a list of science yeah, blogs that are reputable. And what's great about those is that you can go and type in your questions, and these people who sometimes are active scientists will be responding to your questions and and answering questions like that. So I think that's one of the great places, and it's not you know a normal traditional mainstream media type thing, but the blogs are real and they're they're really important. I think. There's actually a podcast that I just started listening to, um, talking biotech, and it's uh, for, uh, the person focuses on genetic modification and farming techniques. And I don't know, that's not my background, and breaks it down for someone who has no background in that field, and I'm starting to, I'm listening to it as I run, and um, it's great, I mean, it's teaching me, and teaching me what's relevant in the field, I'm listening to scientists discuss these topics, so yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Sally could, can, maybe Sally could can also be a source where people can go, and can also like maybe hashtag factual facts. <laughs> or hashtag factual facts. Hashtag factual facts. Factual facts alternative facts. And like nonsense article of the week. Top three nonsense articles of the week. Because like I would go to Sally to find out like what are the top three winners of nonsense posts. Yes. Nonsense Yes. So I think one of the things that a lot of us didn't do before that we're getting more involved with is talking toward local politicians. Yes. So, yeah. um, and that's really everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we and I recently, and maybe other people, met with our local representative and had a great discussion about, you know, what can we as, as people or what can we as scientists do? And I think the more people that talk to the local representatives and tell them the things that matter to you are science funding, um, because they listen to these things, um, because they're getting phone calls about, you know, what's important to them. So. Uh, depending on who your representative is. <laughs> not all of them listen. Not all of them listen, but I mean, you know, there have been recent votes that probably if we, if it was a 90% to 10% calling in, you know, against the health care plan, it might have gone through because they need to know that we're really passionate about these things. Even the ones that don't want to listen, if they have enough people who are calling Yes. Does it, does it work that way with Peter Kerr? <laughs> or these <laughs> elders. Or these <laughs> elders. Um, you mentioned funding and donations. Um, a lot of what we do is currently supported by the NIH and the FDA and all organizations like that, which future funding is in question right now. Many of us are also supported by organizations such as the American Cancer Society or disease-specific organizations, Friends of Spinal Muscular Atrophy and MySpace, for example. Um, so, with, if public funding and government funding is up for question, supporting privately funding organizations, Damon Runyon, um, Howard Hughes, all these other organizations that support research is a really good thing. Also
also laboratories like Coltsman Harbor or Stony Brook, um, Brookhaven Labs, they also accept donations. And I'm going to send you to Jessa, um, over there, who is Coltsman Harbor's public affairs person. Um, she can connect you to the right yeah. development. I mean, just as an example, so that people know, Coltsman Harbor Laboratory is an example of basic research, biological research. You know, we have a little under half of our overall research budget comes from federal sources. Um, that actually puts us, first of all, it's actually a better position than others. Like other, there's other peer institutions that are reliant on federal funding for way more than half. You know, so we have it's something like a third. Jackie, you remember from the tour spiel, but there's something like a third is from private sources, and then there's endowment and other kinds of things. But private sources are huge um, because it's also unrestricted funding, which that gets into a lot of detail. That is sort of how you decide what kind of research is going to happen. Um, you know, and these are this is these are institutions, Stony Brook and Feinstein and Coltsman Harbor Laboratory and Brookhaven are all places right here on Long Island. You know, they're supporting Long Island people that are doing research here. And it's a great place if you're looking to, you know, put donation dollars somewhere, it's a great place. They don't even work in development, so I don't think But there's other things also that, you know, just in terms of being involved and in finding out more about the kind of science that's going on here. There's a ton of amazing research going on on Long Island, and I think a lot of people don't realize it unless they're actually directly involved in that. Just a couple more in case you wanted to just yeah, a lot of the questions seem to be coming from sort of a, a top-down support question, I guess you could say. And I think I'd invite you to look from sort of my perspective of the bottom up. You know, support your school districts. You know, do something with science. You know, show up if it's if it's an open event. If you have kids, if you have grandkids that do a science event somewhere, go. Ask them questions. Take your kids out for a walk. You know, play in the backyard. Read a book about a topic that has a different to do with science or the nature of the environment or something that you don't know about. And that'll help you make more, better decisions. And that'll help you help other people make better decisions. So, you know, yeah, that, that top down supporting these research institutes is really important and great, but it might be a little bit more accessible and a little bit easier to go sort of from the bottom up. Uh, you're in the back over there. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to change the topic. Sorry. I saw in the news a couple of weeks ago they were talking about raised, I think it was dioxin levels in an exhaled water in particular. Um, and then it just sort of disappeared. It was like, oh, the flash, there's this cancer causing chemical in your water supply. Um, and now on to the weather. <laughs> <laughs> what is the current thinking on the status of Long Island drinking water? Well, I'm going to pass that on to you guys here. Uh, Go ahead, Emma. Okay, um, so the dioxin story is a fairly recent development. Uh, and what we know is that on Long Island, there's actually a higher incidence of breast cancer compared to the rest of the country, maybe not so much for other cancers. And there have been large-scale studies in order to understand the environmental factors that might um, cause this. But actually, there haven't been any um, consistent um, results that would point to a single chemical that would be causing it. But I think uh, in those studies, the dioxin is not really in the picture. So I believe that right now, there must be somebody working on it, trying to understand you know, if, it's, uh, if it might be causative of cancer. Uh, I looked it up, and actually, the International Agency for Cancer Research uh, groups it as a group 2B carcinogen, which means that it's possibly carcinogenic which means that there's uh, not enough evidence to really say for sure, you know, if it causes cancer or not. But, uh, uh, Russell, you, you studied this a little bit? Or a little bit, and, and, and I'd like to put it in a broader picture here, and that is that, you know, science is, science is good at a lot of things, but it's not perfect at everything. And um, there are some things that are really, really hard to study, and it takes a very long time to come up with real answers that are meaningful. And uh, contaminants, especially low-level contaminants, are one of those categories. Unless it has a dramatic effect, it occurs really quickly, it's really tough to detangle what causes what. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, we have, we have chemicals like that and, and a, a wide variety of other things. Before studies show sometimes cause effects, sometimes do not, and how the real world, where life is much more complex than it is in the lab, it's really hard to come up with an answer. And that's one of the reasons why you know it's difficult for scientists to really say anything very, very robust. We don't really know. Can I speak to this 
Uh, there, the reason it was in the paper is was to get attention right now because there's a group that's trying to lean heavily on our elected officials in Albany, and there was a vote coming up. I don't know if it's this week or what the exact date was, but the reason for getting it in the media quickly and getting people aware of it, maybe riled up about it because of the way the media handled it all at once. It was everywhere was to make people call their elected officials and say, what's being done? I, I'm hearing this. What can we do? So that their elected officials would have that at the front of their heads when they were going to vote. Right now, there's no um, there's no baseline to study from. So when people say, are we allowed to have this much in our water? There is no this much for that particular chemical. So like there is for other chemicals that we routinely test for at, at the Water Authority. So this was to get people aware of the fact, so they would call their elected official and say, we don't know what the answer is, but we know there are scientists working on it. Can you please, when you go to vote next week, put this on the agenda? And that's why we haven't heard about it yet, because we don't know how they voted yet. And it will come out again in the media as soon as we know, or as soon as scientists have more information about what minimum levels are tolerable. Two very brief comments responses. Uh, one, I grew up in the Grumman Navy, that page blue, uh, and I had prostate cancer, my father died of prostate cancer, my mother died of uh, leukemia cancer, so I'm, I really believe in that. Secondly, for the science teacher, I'm doing an awareness project. Uh, it's called Label uh, uh, Major Storm Events as Climate Change, and we have volunteers who go out right after a storm, and they find a very icy road or a very deep snow to where cars are stuck, and they plant a sign saying, this was caused by climate change. I'm bringing it down to people so they can see it. It's not just the polar bears, it's not just the ice. It's the fact that you couldn't get to work because your car got stuck in too much ice and it, it affects you in your community now. Um, I, yeah, I believe that uh, you know, for a lot of people it's much harder to relate to environmental issues okay. compared to, you know, uh, for example, medical issues, right? Because a lot of people have had uh, cancer in their families and they can relate to that much more easily. But yeah. You know, if you have 65 degree weather on Rhode Island, that's clearly not how. Well, I'll tell you, in Colorado, they were not happy about it because they are losing money skiing. Yes. from the skiing. So they're really upset about the climate change issues. So right. it depends, uh, right? It's well, a little vaccine on Rhode Island, 35 to now. Also, um, uh, Next door to me is our backyard that has a long road for safety points. And usually this time, they're all blue and yellow. They started to bloom in a tremendous ice and rain and snowstorm. They all went down. There are no flowers on that bush now. This is the first time I've ever, 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 ever seen no forsaken flowers on the bushes during the season. This is climate change. Yeah, we have a question. That's the old teacher over there. Um, <laughs> we like the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is not just safety, there's strength in numbers. And we have to stop dealing with, in my day it was called the bubble, now apparently it's called the silo. Who the hell knows why? But anyway. <laughs> the people who are really into social studies have to care about science. And the people who are really into science have to care about home ec. And home ec has to care about kids. It can't just be, the easiest way to pick us off is when we stay in our own small groups. Right? That's the easiest way to shut us up and to um, weaken us as a voice. That's why we're not in our group right now. Right. So what I'm saying is that all of you in your lab, whether you started in a lab or you're now in a lab, also have to get out of your labs and come to the schools and to make yourselves known and to, to impact the curriculum so that it's the bottom up that makes sense. Everything positive in this country has come from grassroots. Yes. Nobody decided in a room full of men, let's give women the vote. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. It's people banging on the door. <clears throat> so we all have a responsibility to support you, but you also have a responsibility to come out and get into those schools and, and confront those leaders and say, no, this is, this is what's going to happen because the more numbers we have, the less they can ignore us. So here's the thing. Uh, we know some teachers that are part of Sally, and they're willing to help us, but sometimes I think they don't know how to go about it in terms of organizing events at schools because they're afraid of parents. 
how the parents are going to react to the fact that, you know, somebody's trying to set up some sort of scientific Throw propaganda. in some trophies, they'll show up. As parents, I think uh, you should let your uh, school officials know that you're interested in that and you welcome. Because we would like to yeah, kind of education go platform, that's work with some, you know, you work with a lot of younger kids. We're thinking of programs like how, how to um, take part of social media posts and, and when you're seeing a Facebook article on the water level, you know, the, the toxins in the water, this or that, how do you, where do you go from there? How do you get to the right information? Um, and those are things that I think someone already mentioned. We have to start teaching those techniques and those critical thinking skills very young. Um, but yeah, we, we, we want to be working with the schools and, and to try to... Well, to that's what CSDL does, the Center for Science, Teaching, and Learning, is all about teaching children about science. They do summer camps, they do camps where the kids have no school. It's all about teaching kids about science and love science now. As they grow up, they know more about science. Okay, I think a lot of that, though, is good. And I think a lot of it might be missing the point in the sense that what I think a lot of people are missing, or a lot of people have hinted at or questions and things you've said today, is what, what's, what's the basis of what we do? It's, it's let's accept what works and reject what doesn't, based on evidence. And that, that's it. That's science. Yep. Period. And I think a lot of people miss that and are intimidated by the specifics of what we do, about what other sciences you read these big words and you don't know, but it's all the same thing where we're figuring out, hey, this works or this doesn't. And that's how <laughs> you want to live your life like that. You know, I, I watched my son when he was little, you know, try and jump from the couch to the coffee table. He missed and he's got a scar of fruit. <laughs> he never did it again. <laughs> right? I accepted what worked. I rejected what didn't work. And I now accept what does. And that, that's the basis of what we do. I think, you know, that, that piece is missing a lot. Sorry, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have an idea. Hopefully, I don't know if in Boy Scouts, and I know Girl Scouts are along the same lines. There's a mixed bag of parents in that group. Some are very, um, you know, into the environment. Some are very, like, you know, going along that route. And then there are others who are not so much. So I think one of the great things about that environment, if you could get in with the Boy Scouts or the or the Girl Scouts and get into their meetings, we have meetings every month. We have we have ten meetings once a twice a week. Um, get in there and, and, and get to the parents who have the kids who are influenced, they will be influenced, influenced by what you're talking about because you're interested in nature. Um, and it would be an easy way in. You don't have to go through the It would be a much easier way in I think, to get them involved. And there's a big task. Our truth is a lot of kids in it. Um, and I come from a great area. We're in Smithtown, and we are very, very red. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, like they tried to put on a show. They tried to um, put on um, the Intimate Truth at the high school, and the parents told us they were not allowed to do that. Oh, I remember. So yeah. So we're and that's actually great because we need to get to people. We need to separate the politics and the science because the science is there regardless of the you're voting for, right? So I can just say, you know, go boys out, boys out, and boys out. So I will tell you that um, the Nassau County Girl Scouts does an annual STEM conference. We have been talking about that for the last four years. Um, and if you want to be start some things similar with the Boy Scouts, I can connect you to the person who's run it. Okay. The Girl Scouts. Nice. Okay. Yes. Um, it does exist with the Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. and it's awesome because like, I do a DNA workshop with them. Mm -hmm. There's a chemist from L'Oreal who teach girls how to make their own lip balm. Mm -hmm. There's a, there was an astrophysics mm -hmm. person who did a space activity with them. There was a mathematician who did an origami thing. Um, and there was also a round robin. It was almost mm -hmm. science career mm -hmm. speed day. Where all the workshop leaders and about 10 or 15 other volunteers at lunch, um, we would spend 10 minutes with a group of kids at a table, and then the bell would ring, and we would move to the next table. And so we got to sit with about four or five different groups throughout lunch, and they could ask us whatever questions they wanted. So the Girl Scouts do. Um, but part of the problem, and I would love your advice on this, is it is a self selective audience. Like here, you are here because you are already interested. The question, and the girls who come to this workshop are already interested. How do we get to those people who don't want to come today? Like and that's what I don't know. Boy Scouts is a for a little thing for the Boy Scouts. Like, don't come to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, as a, 
I get your student when he becomes a little older. I'm a teacher in Smith Town, mm. and there is a little bit of a undercurrent of how how can we get kids to learn about things that maybe in not showing the inconvenient truth they miss, but it's also to speak to this audience and anyone who deals with the public. There's a boot camp that's offered on Stony Brook campus every year that uh, coming from a family of scientists, married into it, and also all, all of my friends from graduate school who've gone through this boot camp. I've just seen 180 degree different people I thought were good speakers are fantastic speakers now. And part of that boot camp, the, it's the Aldo Center, is they send people into Smithtown, um, randomly picked, I'm sure, but they send students because they think if anyone is going to be bored by a scientist's talk, it would be an 11th or 12th grader. Those people are brought there by their classes in the library. They sit there, and scientists have to explain what they do to someone who absolutely doesn't want to be there. And those kids are laughing. They're completely riveted. It's not because these students started as great speakers, but it's because they've been through this training on how to explain what you do in a very simple way and engaging way and telling a story that's relevant to people. And that's helpful to talk to legislators, it's helpful to talk to the public, to scouts, of people of any age. So I would recommend it. I would give a plug for the Alda Center if anybody has to. Feels like they're not the best communicator or knows someone in their lab who's not the best communicator. Or people I thought were really good communicators still came out of this fantastic. Uh, in terms of where you can get information, uh, there's a lot of scientists who directly engage with people on Twitter. Uh, I follow most of the astronomy ones because that's what I'm really into. But I'm aware of like some of the marine biology ones and this and that. And I mean, I've gone on some and just like, hey, I have a question about this. Like, what does metals mean? You know, I'm reading this journal article about metals and. I have an idea of what that means to me as a regular citizen, and they're like, oh, it's anything beyond uh, helium in the periodic table. <laughs> Never would guess that, like, because that's not in my life what a metal is, right? So I asked an astrophysicist, and she told me, just straight up. So there's a lot of people who enjoy interacting with regular Joes like us, and Joannas, uh, <laughs> via social media. Uh, so that's one way. Another way people have brought a podcast, uh, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe deals a lot with science and skepticism. Uh, and how to evaluate scientific news critically. They talk about science journalism, science communication, science itself. Uh, so it's a really, really valuable resource, I found. It changed the way I look uh, at science. And just a general question for everyone, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, uh, is how do you deal with science illiteracy on a bipartisan level? Like, we spoke about this like two weeks ago. That obviously we're all like to beat up on the Republicans on climate change and evolution and this and that, but genetically modified uh, food and uh, vaccines and homeopathy and all these kinds of things that tend to appeal more to the left are big problems for us. So how do you deal with that on a bipartisan issue? Anyways. Yes. <laughs> Seriously. I, again, going back to what we do is based on fact, or based on collected data, not how we feel. It's, it's, this is what we've observed and this is what we've seen. Read this. And I found a lot of times Someone doesn't know something or has a has a, I said the wrong opinion, but that's not really what I mean. If you show them here, th this is yeah, and unsupported. This is what is actually happening. Oh. Some people do. I, you're right. People, some people don't. But I think some people do. I think the the, the reasonable people, the, 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 the people that aren't reasonable, no matter what you present them with, they're la la la. Listen. But, but they're never going to 